Okay. Are we live? No. Oh. Yes. Hey, hello, we're live now. I'm Dave Solberg, Managing Editor of the RV Repair Club, and welcome to our live questions and answers. I see we got quite a few people um, that are uh, already on the chat, and uh, welcome. It's uh, Friday the 15th, and uh, starting to get a little bit of good weather. I see a lot of RVs starting to hit the road a little bit, too, so... It's Thursday. I said Friday. Excuse me. It is Thursday. Angie corrected me. Hope, just wishful thinking that it was Friday. So anyway, let's start off with the first question. Angie, what do you got? Isn't there one on there? I see. Uh, oh, that's from uh, Katie. It says, welcome, everybody. Well, until we get a question, one of the things uh, that's kind of exciting, it's going to start up here in, in just a little bit. Uh, Saturday, I am flying out to Las Vegas, Nevada and renting a car and going up to Death Valley. And I am going to uh, be kind of the technical advisor and help out with a production shoot of what's called the Rubberfoot Buffalo. It's a, a Jeep adventure type of a program. A friend of mine uh, ran it last year and did eight, eight episodes and ended up uh, getting on the Outdoor Channel. And they have a, I think it's a 2016 ICANN Renegade, huge monster coach. It's a... Uh, I got a semi front end, so it's a super C basically, and a uh, massive motor coach on the backside. They uh, all pull a trailer with that that'll haul two Jeeps inside of it. And then uh, they also have a hike uh, trailer that they've wrapped in this rubber foot buffalo theme. And uh, they're going to be shooting out there. And the last time they shot, they had uh, quite a few different RV related issues as they were trying to do their production. and. So having a little bit of video background and the RV background, uh, my friend asked me to come out there and, and help him get through this. And the, the series is all about uh, finding mysteries and climbing rocks and stuff with these tricked out Jeeps that are basically mini monster trucks. And uh, so it should be a fun time and we'll post some things on what we, we get out there. It's called Rubberfoot Buffalo. Look at their Facebook page. So do we have a... What is the best car for towing is our first question. And um, I'm assuming that you're, you're looking at a uh, towed, we call it, a car being towed behind a motorhome. Um, let, let's address that one first and see if a question comes up on the other side of it. I don't think you really are looking for a car to tow um, a trailer. So the best car to, to, to tow behind an, an RV, a motorhome, is one that will be allowed to tow on all fours, and which is called four wheeling. And the thing you got to be careful with is not every car can do that without ruining the transmission or the transaxle because your wheels are turning, your axles are turning, your, your gears are turning inside, but you have no lubrication being pumped into those. So you need to find a car that when you put it in neutral, disengages all that stuff um, or has a transfer case that's able to uh, withstand that and if you go to um, well it used to be motorhome magazine uh, dot com and I'm not sure who has it now but there's dinghy guides out there that have some of the best towing vehicles that, that are out there if you can see that Saturns were great I uh, always saw a ton of those out in the market my folks towed a Malibu um, for, for many years and they just put it in neutral and uh, turn the ACC on because you don't want the steering wheel to lock and then pull a couple fuses out of the side and that kept the speedometer odometer from racking up miles um, on that vehicle and uh, one of the most popular i see is jeeps because um, jeeps are very versatile they can you know normally four-wheel drive and, and just about anything with four-wheel drive when you put it in the neutral part of four-wheel drive it free wheels and then you're able to to tow most of that stuff um, flat on the ground but the nice thing about a jeep is it's comfortable enough to use for a touring car if you're going to zip around towns or you know, places um, that, that you want a, a nice, comfortable vehicle, but it also with the four wheel capabilities, if you're going to do any kind of uh, boondocking or off-roading, then, then you can use that, um, you know, to get around in some of the harder places to get. So look for something that you can tow on all fours safely without damaging it. Otherwise you're going to have to get a, um, a dolly and put the wheels up on a dolly and, the, the issue with that takes more time loading and unloading, but the, the big thing is that when you get to a campground site, sometimes you don't have enough room for your motorhome, your tow vehicle, and your dolly. You have to put the dolly over in a corral. It costs more money. So anyway, um, 
that will, like I say, Saturns are very good. So Angie's got a really funny look at. Then they said, interesting. I would think the smallest car would be the best for towing. Thank you for your answer. You know, uh, well, and I think smallest. She said, interesting. Uh, I think the smallest car would be best for towing, and uh, it depends on your rig too. That's that's something that I'm um, glad you brought that up. That. You know, you got a, a big diesel pusher, you can tow just about anything, you know, 7,000 pounds. But some of your, your gas uh, chassis motorhomes, you're limited into sometimes 2,500 or 3,000 pounds. The newer ones now are getting up into about 5,000, so it gives you a little more flexibility. Uh, but no matter what you tow with, if you're towing anything over 1,500 pounds, my recommendation is to get supplemental brakes, whether you use the Roadmaster or Blue Ox. Um, it's a brake system because remember when you're when you're not towing this vehicle behind there if the engine's not running and, and of course nobody's in it to hit the brake you have no brakes and so you're adding that weight to your vehicle and every state has different road use laws like Iowa anything over three thousand pounds has to have supplemental brakes New Jersey anything over one one thousand five hundred pounds so it must be harder to stop in New Jersey than it is in Iowa for some reason I don't know why the difference but um, those sit in the floor. They have their own gyro, so it kind of it pushes the brake pedal. You have a lever that hits the brake pedal. So good idea to get supplemental brakes if you're towing a toad, we call it, behind the RV. Okay. Christine asks, what are your thoughts of the coating products for RV roofs? Christina says, what is my thought on the coating, coating products for RV roofs? And... Uh, yeah, there, there, there seems to be a, a ton of materials coming into the market now because the RV market is starting to explode again. And you see a lot of stuff used in the industrial side of things, housing side, residential side. Um, you know, my, my first recommendation to anybody with an RV is to understand what roof material you have, clean it a couple times a year, condition it with what they recommend to condition with, and then you probably won't need a coating on top of it, you just, the conditioner. In my opinion, Dicor makes some of the best products uh, that's out in the market. They've been in it for many, many years. They understand the materials. They sell the materials. Um, so they have a conditioner that will keep that from chalking and from deteriorating. But if you do need a coating, um, you wanna recondition your, your rig. They also have a roll on kind of a rubberized uh, coating that uh, that they offer that is, has been very, very, um, um, well, well known. We are going to hopefully this summer uh, get a unit that needs to be recoded and put some of that on. And it's just a, you put it in a, a paint um, pan and take a roller brush and just roll it on and let it set and it seals and coats and, and uh, lasts forever. So I, I really like the Dicor stuff. Jackie asks, is it better and or cheaper to replace a bad airbag system with heavier cold springs. Okay, so Jackie asks, is it, is it uh, better and cheaper and or cheaper to replace airbags um, in, in a suspension, did it say? Or just- a Bad airbag system with heavier- Bad coil airbag springs. system with heavier coil springs. And uh, what I think you're referring to is the Chevrolet old P30 chassis had coil springs in the front with airbags in the inside of it. And I would say 90% of those airbags went flat. Um, they were very small airbags and people didn't realize they were even in there. And then when they lost air, the, the coil springs that were in there would pinch those and then, and then break the bag. Um, I personally didn't think those bags were, were did a whole lot uh, to help that suspension system. My, my recommendation uh, would be to take a look at uh, Roadmaster and Safety Plus and, um, and look at some of the suspension enhancements, but I would also look at maybe changing. Uh, in fact, I've got a guy here I uh, just talked to yesterday that has a, an Itasca Sonova, and they're going to take and uh, put in heavier-duty Bilstein uh, uh, coil um, shock absorber with a with a coil enhancement package i don't know i don't know who he was going to get i was I'm, I'm hoping to get down there and take a look at it and do some video stuff but i would i would say it would be much better to upgrade into a different coil system but then also look at what roadmaster and uh, safety plus has to offer 
as an addition. You'll take away a lot of that. Uh, we call it elephant on roller skates um, syndrome um, with your RV. Jackie asks, is it better? Nope, next one. Joan adds, um, that one. Steve asks, what are the expenses with a turbo diesel? Steve asks, what are the expenses with a turbo diesel? And, um, you know, so right now uh, I run a company that we have three Duramax, um, two 2500s, one 3500s. We've had the Ford um, F-350s in the past. And, and, you know, the expense that you run into with those is the oil changes are, are expensive, um, especially if you go synthetic. You're looking at probably $200 or more just for an oil change. But um, other than that, you know, you really don't have a lot of um, expense except for DEF. Uh, you have to put DEF in about every 10,000 miles, but you're looking at, you know, maybe five, $6 for a, a gallon or maybe it's a two gallon thing of, of that. Um, you know, where you do run into the expense with the diesels is when you have to start getting into some of the turbo issues or um, you know, the, the engines, they don't, I, I don't think they have glow plugs anymore, but they've got the injectors and certain um, electronics in those. And, you know, uh, we put um, about 130,000 miles a year on those, on those diesels. And knock on wood, we had one turbo back in one of the F-350s um, and, uh, and a set of injectors on a different one. You know, so the turbo, you're, you're looking at about $3,000 or more. The injectors, uh, I think we put in about $2,000 in those. But out of the rest of the probably 10 or more units we've had, we've had no problems at all. We put 300,000 miles on them before we trade them in and, and buy new ones. So, you know, the, the, the oil changes are more expensive, but then you're going to go longer with them. You know, you're probably looking at uh, seven to 8,000 8, miles. Uh, versus the three to five thousand, but you are going to do twenty-four. Um, I believe it's twenty-four quarts of oil in the big ones, and the filter's more expensive. So you know you you do have that expense, but uh, again, you get into the situation of you got to look at what you're towing, the weight that you have, and if you are going up in above the six seven thousand pound uh, trailer GVWR loaded, uh, you're not going to be happy with gas. You're going, to, you're going to definitely want to go up. And the other thing with diesel is that you, you get a better resale value on the backside. So you put 100,000 miles on a gas, you're going to get probably 25% less uh, trade-in value than you would with the diesel. It holds its value better. So especially now, diesel is hard to find. You can, you can get a lot of money for a used diesel. Alan asks, uh, Dave, my slide keeps wandering out while driving. What do I need to do to repair? Also, need to let you know when I slide in or out, I use the hand crank due to ears on motor being stripped. Help, please, and thanks. Okay. Uh, Alan said that his slide room is creeping out as he is driving down the road, and he has to use his hand crank to bring it in and out because the gears are stripped. And typically, what that means is that you've got a leak in, in the seal. And I'm not sure what slide room you're, you're referring to, um, it, whether it's hydraulic or electric, uh, and when I refer to the seals, I'm referring to the hydraulic version of it. So you've got these lines and you've got these, these seals that are supposed to keep the pressure of that liquid in, that, that fluid in there. And if the seals are starting to get a little weak, it just lets a little bit of that fluid seep through and then it doesn't hold the pressure of that unit in at two pounds per square inch is what they typically say. And so it lets it kind of seep out. So. Um, I would definitely get in touch with the company, whether it's Lipper, HWH. Um, those are about the only two. I don't think HWH has much of anything out there, but uh, in my opinion, one of the best ones um, originally. But um, just find out if you can get a seal kit for that. If it's the electric unit, then, um, you know, that one, you're st if, you, if your gears are stripped, then that's probably something you're, you're going to have to come back in and, and uh you know, rebuild that motor or replace that motor or those gears. I'm not sure where your gears are at. Again, there's there's so many different, there's Quickie, there's uh, Swing Tech, there's uh, Power Gear, Lippert has their own proprietary one, but they bought all these other ones out. So 
you gotta you gotta find out which system you have. Now, one of the things you might want to do if you're you know happy with cranking the unit in and out by your hand crank already, is uh, put in a, just a set of latches. Um, you know, some of the units for quite a few years, you would bring them in, and then you had two floor latches on the bottom that you would just bring this little hook and snap them up on on the edge that came down. Uh, some of the other ones had latches or not latches; they were a, a pry bar basically up on the top and you would just put that in and crank it and it would push this rod out so the inside lip of your um, slide room and the wall would keep that pulled in all the time. So you might just want to put a couple safety latches in and, and uh, you know, not go through the expense. John asks, I have a Heartland travel trailer and one of the spouts for the rain broke. Is this an easy fix? Okay, uh, John says he's got a Heartland travel trailer and one of these spouts for the rain broke. Okay, so I'm assuming that you're talking about the um, on the drip rail up above, you've got an awning rail and a drip rail and as the water comes down, it, it goes out. And then at the very end, they've got these two little spouts that stick out um, almost like little funnels that try to divert the water out away from an entry door or other places like that. So if it's just that end cap, that's an easy, that's an easy fix. Most of the time, those are just an add on to your, your generic drip rail that goes along the top. Alyssa asks ideas for roof patching. I'm not too fond of patching one area as that area seems to always screw up again. Okay. Alyssa, was that right? Alyssa. Alyssa wanted uh, ideas for roof patch. Uh, she doesn't like the the one spot patch because it seems to always screw up. And, and if if that's the case, then I, I would tend to say you're probably not using the, the correct patch material or method. Um, you know, I've patched several roofs using a Um We've got uh, some other stuff that Dicor makes. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'm not sure if you're patching the roof itself or trying to patch the sealant that's in certain areas, whether it's the sidewall to roof or front cap or vents and things like that. But the thing you also have to make sure you do is you get the right sealant and the right patch for the material that you have up there, whether it's fiberglass. I'm assuming it's probably a rubber membrane if you're patching it because fiberglass usually doesn't, you know, doesn't need to be patched, hopefully. Uh, but I, I would, you know, first of all, you got to clean it properly and make sure there's, there's no contaminants on it or no sap or anything else like that. Um, then you had to make sure uh, you're using the right material. And a turnabond is a good one. If you're looking at a bigger area, then I would suggest that Dicor material we talked about beforehand that is uh, just a complete roof reconditioning product. And it's not hard to do, really. The hardest part is just cleaning the roof and getting it prepped, and then you're just rolling it on like painting the floor. Doug asks, how do you sanitize a water tank on a 2017 Thor Miramar? Yep. Doug asks, how do you, how do you um, sanitize a, a freshwater tank, did it say, or just water tank? It said water tank. Water tank. I'm assuming a freshwater tank on a 2017 Miramar. And there's a couple ways you can do it. I usually use bleach. I'll take about uh, probably uh, two cups of bleach, depending on the size of, of your tank. And I'm assuming with a Miramar, you probably have a, at least a 50-gallon tank, and you're probably up into the 65 or so like that. So, um, you know, uh, two cups of bleach and a full tank of water and just drive around the block with it one time, get a good sloshed up, mixed up, um, and then let it set for 24 hours, drain it out. And um, you can run some vinegar back through it to, to get the bleach smell out of it, but bleach will dissipate within, um, you know, a, a few days. One of the things you do want to do also is that then once you let it set for a couple of days, Run it through everything in your system. Run it through your, your shower, your toilets, your sinks, your shower outside, all that stuff, just to get all the water lines that are in your unit uh, sanitized. Now, we do have from Thetford, and I do not have it with me here. If you don't like the bleach smell, Thetford has a freshwater tank sanitizer. Now, let me just see if I got that here. People will see tissue dissolver level
How handy is that? Fresh water tank sanitizer. So it's just a kit. Got a couple different sanitizer and cleaner. So yeah, this would this would be a, a good product. Um, you know, we just got this in to try and, and do some videos on it this um, this summer coming up. And Thetford has a whole line of products. For, you know, they've got tissue digester, they got level gauge cleaner, they have toilet seal lubrication. So they've got a whole lineup of of products uh, for your tanks and and various plumbing. Um, deals, but I think that uh, this would probably be one of the best things in there. Then you don't have the bleach um, taste and stuff out of it as well. Tom asks, thoughts on programmers for V10? Tom asks, thoughts on programmers for V10? So you got a Ford uh, with a Triton V10 engine in it on a, on a gas chassis and you look for programmers. And, um, you know, I, I have not gotten too much into that because, you know, every time you look at some type of an aftermarket uh, product, um, you know, for, for the engines, you get a big red flag from the engine manufacturer on messing with their, their CPUs and their oxygen systems and all this other kind of stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of performance enhancement products like the, the Bulldog, I think, is one of them for diesel trucks and uh, various things. I have not gotten too much into that, uh, like I say, because of the, the flags that, that raise up with the Ford. But, um, you know, if you're having problems with that V10, if, if it's a fuel issue, if it's anything else, you know, I pretty much steer people back to a Ford dealership that, that is familiar with that Triton V10 engine. That's not every Ford dealership. You gotta have somebody that can get the RV in First of all, and they got a bay big enough for it, and uh, you know are, are able to do that. But you know, we we typically don't see the average RV owner trying to you know do any programming with his uh, with his. It's a computer system in in that engine. So. Darren asks, just bought my first used Zinger trailer. Could you recommend any key things to do to make certain it's ready for the road? Um. Darren just bought a new, bought a first used Zinger trailer. He wants to know if there's any key things that uh, he can do to, to keep it, get it on the road. Um, you know, I guess if it's if it's your first unit and you're, you're starting to get going out, I would highly recommend getting a uh, first of all getting a departure checklist. That's a that's a big thing so that you know that you're going to check all these things. And I believe you can download one uh, from the site. Just go in and do a Google search on departure checklist. I know we've got videos on that as well. And basically what that's doing is it gives you that list, kind of like an airline pilot says, uh, da, 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 so you don't forget anything. It's the jacks up, the TV antenna down, the steps in. Uh, I've un I unhooked the, the, uh, water, the water system, the electrical system, television cable cord if, if I want. Um, I would also, since it's your first new one, I would recommend that you do a good thorough walk around of the, you know, the rough edges and just make sure that, um, you know, your sealant is all really good before you forget about it. And you might have to reseal some areas. Not sure how the previous owner took care of it. Not sure how long it sat around. Um, definitely take a look at your tires and make sure they're not weather checked. Check the tread on them and the pressure on them. Just make sure you got proper inflation and, um, you know, you know, tires are, we've, we've said this many, many times, they're the most vulnerable, vulnerable component on an RV and they're the most neglected. And, uh, I do seminars all over the country and I ask how many people, you know, check their tires every time they go out. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's amazing how, how small the number is that, that actually does that. So, um, you know, and then the other thing was, um, if, if you're new into this, I would say do a, a little a little test camp, um, take it out in the parking lot, or not the parking lot, driveway, spend a night in the, in the driveway with it, maybe do a little cooking with it just to get a, a, you know accustomed or acquainted with how your, your stove works, how your furnace works, or your air conditioner, or you know those components before you get out into some place 
that it doesn't work and it ruins your, your vacation. So a, a nice little, we call it a shakedown cruise, whether it's in the driveway or maybe a campground that's, that's really close, that if something does go wrong, you can get back and, you know, not, not ruin a, a, a long trip with it. There's a reminder announcement that our free download for the night is how to keep mice out of your RV, and Katie's going to put it in the chat, the link. Okay, so we have a free download tonight. It is how to keep mice out of your RV, and that's by getting 15 cats. And No, that wasn't it. And uh, Katie is going to put it in the chat room, so you have a free download on how to keep mice out of your RV. Tom asks, what is the best way to attach a solar panel to the roof of a motorhome with a fiberglass roof? Mm -hmm. Is it safe to use adhesive rather than drilling holes in the roof? He has a 2019 Umar Cannon Star. Okay. So Tom, right? Tom asks, what's the best way to mount solar panels to the roof? He's got a fiberglass roof on a Numar. And uh, is it safe to use to drill holes or to do silicone or an adhesive? And we put... Um, we did this exact same thing on a 2003 Winnebago Brave um, on, in a video here, and that has a fiberglass roof, very similar to what yours is. So the way your roof structure is manufactured, is right here. So you've got the fiberglass outer skin here, that's very, very thin. And then you have a Luon wood backing in here and then all this styrofoam, you know, in, in here and then framework on the outside edge. And, uh, you know, so what I would recommend is to do the four feet at the corners with the screws that they provide and silicone inside of it. But then I would, I would also uh, coat the entire foot of that. You'll, you'll probably have uh, big feet like this on the, on the corners, rounded feet. And then if you take in just silicone, and when I say silicone, I, that, that's kind of a generic term. I'm, what I, what I, you need to do is use a sealant that is designed for your RV. And since you have fiberglass, you are going to need a fiberglass sealant, which I do not have. Yes, I do. There it is. Okay. I feel like Mr. Peabody's closet. And for some of you out there, you will get that reference if you're old enough to remember only having two channels on your TV. I used to, I told my granddaughters that when I was little, I used to have to get, get up early in the morning and walk all the way across the room to change the channels, both of them. So this is the sealant you want, 311 RV sealant. And it is designed for fiberglass. So you got to make sure it's good for fiberglass. And then this is what's called self-leveling sealant. And that's important on these, on these feet that you put on because it's going to basically just coat that entire thing. And you want to do it a good two inches around that. So it's, it's okay to put a fastener through the fiberglass. Um, you know, and then when you put this on top of it, it's going to completely encase that thing and you will never have a problem with that thing coming off. Kurt asks, I want to change my wheels and tires. There are tons of information on tires, but hardly any information on load capacity on wheels. Does it seem to make, doesn't seem to make sense to be able to have a tire with load capacity over 3,000 pounds if the wheels are only capable of 2,200 pounds. Any suggestions? Yes. The question is that he wants to change out his tires and, and rims. And there's a ton of information about load capacity on tires, but there's very little on rims. He's concerned that it's uh, you know not safe to put 3,000-pound load capacity tires on a 2,200 pound capacity rims. And that is, that is very true. That's, that's, uh, that's a good question. The tire and rim uh, manufacturers association has some information on that. Um, another place that you can go to is the um, RV safety and education foundation. Trey Seelman runs that and has done extensive research on rims and tires. And um, you know, there's been a huge problem with tires out in the market 
that uh, are underinflated or overloaded, um, improper tires being put on on units just because the, the local tire shop says, well, everybody puts these on that. And so it's good you're doing your research. Um, you know, one of the things that you should be able to find a little more information on is if you if you go to your, um, you know, a, a rim specialist, like we have Midwest Wheels here that sells rims. We have trailer, um, you know, companies uh, that, that, that sell trailers and their tires and so forth. The other thing I, I might uh, recommend is if you're looking to trade those out, um, there's a company, online company called eTrailer.com and they sell rims and they have a very, very knowledgeable technical support staff there that uh, will help walk you through that stuff. But I, I would probably say the first thing you want to do is, is um, go to the RV Safety and Education Foundation, which is at rvsafety.com and just send Trey a, a, a question on the rims that you're looking at. Um, and, and he'll be able to direct you into more specific information and, and unbiased is, is the big thing because you can get any answer you want from dealers. Arlene asks, if the motorhome is used maybe once a month, what is the best way to ensure the fresh water tank is safe to drink? If the motorhome is used once a month, um, you know, the best thing that I, I would recommend is, is to drain the water out because if you have water in there sitting for a month, it's going to start to get stagnant anyway. So, you know, some people say, well, I don't want to keep throwing water out. And like, well, I can understand that, but I, it's just going to get kind of skunky as it sits in there for, for over a month. Um, you can use these products here, which we talked about beforehand, the fresh water tank sanitizer. Um, there, there is also a product that uh, I think Thetford has that is just a uh, fresh water conditioner. You know, so you can drain it out and just put a little bit of that in there, um, you know, before you drain it and then just leave it and then it should be okay to be able to come back and, and fill it up. DJ asks, um, he has a 38 TT, 38 yep. foot TT, uh, weight with weight distribution installed correctly, but I get a lot of pro proposing. Would <laughs> You know, it's it's very fun to watch and listen to Angie sometimes going through these questions. Uh, what was his name? DJ. But DJ. Would, would adding airbags to rear suspension of truck help? Okay. So the question is, Angie says that uh, DJ has a 38 TT. That's a travel trailer. That uh, just like when she goes TT. And uh, he put the um, uh, weight distribution hitch on it. Uh, correctly, and he still gets some porpoising, Angie, yeah, but it, it was not quite pronounced like that. So it, it, highway hop is what we, we call it as well. And yes, that can be, uh, well, and there's there's a couple different things that, that could do that. The fir first thing you need to do is you need to go weigh your rig without the weight distribution hitch connected to it and just see where you're at. So you go to a pilot, um, or Flying J and they've got cat scales. So you put your truck on the first scale and your trailer on the second scale. Um, or actually, take that back. You put your steer wheels on the first scale. You put your drive wheels and your hitch on the second scale. And then you put your trailer tires on the third scale. And what you're looking for is what is your weight on, on that hitch um, of your of your truck. You might have too much weight in the front and you might need to move some stuff back, especially if you got a 38 foot travel trailer. I'm assuming you got a pretty big storage compartment in the front. And one of the misconceptions in the RV industry is that just because you have great big compartments all over the place in this RV doesn't mean you can fill them up. You know, you can only put so much weight into that rig and you have to have proper weight distribution. And you can only have so much on the hitch. And if you even if you put a weight distribution hitch on that front or system on there, um, you know, it doesn't mask overloading the, the front of that thing. And so that would be the first thing. So you might have to shift some of the stuff back. But, um, you know, I have seen in a lot of cases where if you have um, a truck that does not have the off-road package, then the leaf springs on the back are a little bit on the weak side and you probably want to put airbags in it or uh, some kind of a, a truck stabilizer. Now there is a product on the market and um, I, I, I don't have the name of it, but it was Bill Plemons 
out of North Carolina, and it was Plemons RV, has developed some type of a bar that goes on into the, um, the leaf springs on the back side of it, and he claims it completely eliminates the highway hop and the sway as you go down the road uh, because, you know, that's, that's where it's starting, at your truck. And so you might want to take a look at that, and I'll see if I can get some more information on where that's at. But I saw it at the show two years ago when we had shows, and hopefully I'll see it again this fall and, and be able to pitch it. But um, weigh the coach first, make sure you know your weights, and then look at some kind of a, a suspension system. Terry asks, are there alternate drawer locking mechanisms? Terry asks, are there alternate drawer or door? Drawer. Drawer locking, locking. Yeah, there, there are, you know, over the years, there's been a dozen different type of drawer um, latches and locks and stuff like that. There, there's some, uh, the best ones, in my opinion, are the ones that have the ball bearing rails that go along the side and, and they slide in at the very end. They do a little click and they hold in, you know, they get a little bit of a tug to get them to come out. But, you know, the biggest problem with drawers is that, you know, Manufacturers are trying to make these things as cheap as humanly possible, and and whoever looks at the drawers when they go to buy an RV, you know, I mean, when you walk through the thing, you look at the floor plan, you fall in love with the floor plan, you look at colors, you go, oh wow, it's got this refrigerator, it's got this and this and this. I, I've never seen anybody walk into an RV and open a drawer and go, hey, this has got really good rails or locks in them. So you see this really cheap stuff. Most of them are going to put a plastic type of a, or, well, a, a wood runner with a plastic uh, holder on one end and the other end, and those almost always break. Um, sometimes you get the little locks underneath. So uh, I would recommend taking a look at, um, oh, man, I can't even think of the name of them now. But, uh, I mean, there's a lot of lock companies out there. Um, Trimark has made several. And I cannot think of the bearing company, but I think if you uh, were to to do a um, a Google search on um, drawer locking mechanisms, you'll you'll see that the, that those guide rails are are the better of that I've seen out. So there are a variety of different ones. Bill asks, I have a Dodge thirty five hundred gram single axle. I am good on overall weight, but my back axle 7,000 is over by 1,500. What are my options? Well, uh, Bill, Bill says that he's got a Dodge Ram 3,500, and his overall weight is good, but he's too heavy on the back axle. He's got a single axle, and he's at 7,000 pounds, and he says he's 1,500 over, 1,200, 1,500 over on that. So he needs to be down about 5,500, and you actually should probably be even less than that because you want to take 10% off of that. So about the only option you have is to see if there is any way, if, if you're okay overall in GVWR, then you got too much stuff up in the front of that rig. So see if you can't move anything in the front of that rig to, to the back. Um, and one of the things you might want to look at is do you have water in there? Because if you have a water tank and you put full water in there, you've got, um, uh, you know, 8.6 gallon pounds per gallon. So you could have 400, 500 pounds of water in that front end. Um, you know, I don't know you're going to be able to shift 1,500 pounds back to that back um, portion of it in there, but I would say you definitely need to try and figure out how you can move any of that stuff towards the back that you possibly can. You, you can't enhance the, the, the axle. You know, some people say, well, I'm going to put a weight distribution hitch. You know, that might move a little bit of it. Um, I'm going to put in uh, airbags in the back. You 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 can't mask overweight in that back end. You you got to you got to get the back end. I mean, it's it's either get a bit different truck or get a different RV if you can't do one of those other things. And I hate to say that. And, and you know, I mean, the what the RV safety education has said for years. There's a difference between legally towing and safely towing. So, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I've been doing it for 10 years and I've never had a problem. You know, that, that's probably true. There's people that go 80 miles an hour all the time down the highway and never get a ticket. But that, that, that's, you know, that's not always the case. And, you know, it's not illegal to do that stuff, but it's just going to, you're going to run into issues with that, that rear end, with your brakes, um, 
you know, bearings, all that kind of stuff. Alyssa asks, uh, just purchased a 1991 28-foot Founder RV. Anything you're aware of that is something to watch out for with these? It's our first RV. It's 1998. So 19, she just bought a, bought a 1991 Bounder. What length? 28 foot. 28 foot. Um, is there anything we should be aware of with these? Well, the biggest thing in those, um, I would say you really want to watch your sealants, you want to watch your roof, the sidewall joint, your front cap, your clearance lights, all that stuff. You want to look for leaks. That's that's the big thing, especially when you're getting back into 1991, because uh, right about that time uh, there was Phylon with Luon, and I don't I don't know the exact year that the bounder did it, but they came in and did a different process in the lamination of the sidewall, because normally you have this is your typical sidewall. And you're going to have an outer skin that's fiberglass like this, and yours is going to be beige. And it's got a little kangaroo on the front, and it's Hoppy, that's his name. And you'll have a thin fiberglass here with a Luon backing inside and, and uh, block foam insulation. And there was a period, and I think it was after 91, but 89 time frame kind of comes into mind, if I remember correctly. They... They used a Mindy board, which was a, 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 a particle board backing instead of Luon, and it would start to swell, like you see countertops that have the um, particle board backing that get water and moisture into it. Fleetwood also went to a, a very hard backing material, kind of like a Formica type product in there, and if you got moisture in inside of that, that glue would separate and you would get these great big delamination areas. So uh, in my opinion, with that model year, that you really need to make sure that the floor joint where the floor meets the sidewall is sealed really well around your wheel wells, roof to sidewall, front cap, and so forth. Judy asks, how much play should there be in the steering wheel of a coach? Judy asks, how much play should there be in the steering wheel of a coach? And there should not be a lot of play in that because you've got a, you've got a pretty massive size unit and I would say probably what's happening and I don't I don't know what that it didn't say what coach or anything like that so but obviously it's a motorhome and you know you start getting and play is where you've got this is you, you do this and nothing happens to the tire and so what's happening is you're getting wear um, you know down in your either in the steer, steering column um, and I, I can't remember if they call them pinions or what the the connecting piece of that is or it could be uh, in your tie rods um, you know and, and your suspension so I would really suggest getting it into um, some type of a dealership or a truck center that's familiar with that type of chassis whether you got the Chevy P30 or the the Ford F53 or whatever it is um, have somebody take a look at those because I, I think you're starting to get some wear and tear off of those and eventually what's going to happen is you get into some wet driving conditions or snowy conditions. And with that kind of play, you start getting a little more, you know, you, you have less steering capability out of that and, and uh, you know, less command of your steering. Joe asks, my sea level two tank level monitors seem to not be working since the freeze in Texas how to locate and diagnose. Okay, so Joe says his sea level um, monitors on his, do you see a freshwater tank or just tank? Okay, on his tank are not working since they had the freeze down in Texas, what should I look for? And most of those sea level tanks uh, monitoring system are probes that are on the side of the tank. And they don't, have, and when I say probes, they're actually just little stickers that are, are going on to that. And the way they come in is you've got one of the probes comes in with the power, 12 volt power here, and then another probe over here, here, and here. And as the water level goes up, it does ultrasound, where the old style did actual electricity through it. This will do uh, ultrasonic uh, depth perception of those. And so if you have no readings whatsoever, um, you know, I, I would, first of all, make sure that your tanks aren't frozen, I guess, you know, because if you have solid tanks in there, it's not going to, you know, it, it freezes along the inside, but, you know, Texas has thawed out since that's happened. So if you check them again, 
but then you're just going to have to go in and just take a multimeter and, and check for power to that to that system. I don't know that the freeze would have done anything, um, and you know, unless the C level ones that you have, and the C level is just a brand, um, unless those are, are probes that go inside, it could have frozen those and and then got something uh, coated over it. But I, I'm pretty sure they're the ultrasound kind, of ultrasonic. Kyle asks, I have a 2002 Winnebago Journey. The neck on the fuel tank is small enough that it will not accommodate a truck diesel nozzle. Is it possible to have someone modify our tank so we don't have to hunt around for pumps with the smaller auto diesel nozzle? Okay, so um, they said they got a 2002 Journey, which is a diesel pusher um, on a Freightliner chassis, and the fuel fill in it is a automotive diesel style fuel fill. And that means it's the smaller one that's designed for you to go into the come and goes and the and the various uh, convenience store places um, and not go into the truck bays of it. And the truck bays are going to have a large, you know, almost an inch and a half uh, inside diameter nozzle where you got about an inch on the other one. And I've run into this myself several times trying to find an auto diesel that I can get my bigger unit in there and, and, uh, and, and fill it up. Um, I, I, I have not seen the procedure for doing this, but what I would highly recommend is that you call Winnebago Industries and you contact their uh, owner relations department. They've got some great guys in there. Troy, uh, Troy Swearingen runs the department. He, he hates it every time I say his name because people call, I want to talk to Troy. But any of the guys in there can help you with it. Um, the, it's 641-585. 3535 gets you into the main switchboard and just ask for owner relations. And I, I know that they've got some kind of a procedure because that, that, that would not be the first time that that has come up. You know, with a unit that big, you definitely want to get over into the truck side or uh, even, even your RV lanes at your uh, Flying J's and stuff now um, pretty much have the bigger diesel because you're, you're looking at putting in 100 gallons of diesel and with that smaller uh, pump nozzle, it, it takes forever. Tom asks, what is your opinion about installing the retro and inserts onto the front tires of a Class A? Tom says, what is my opinion on installing the inserts onto the front end of a Class A? And so when, you, when he says, what was the other term? Retro. Retro um, inserts. And I, what I'm assuming you're, you're, look, you're talking about is the... Um, Wheel covers, um, you know, typically they come in, they've got uh, stainless steel that you have to take the lug nuts off and put in this, this uh, a false chrome mag is what it looks like. Um, you know, I, I, I see those do, that done all the time. Winnebago, uh, when we were doing that, uh, used them a lot. The only thing I would be careful with is when you do that, those have a tendency to shift a little bit, even no matter how tight you get them, they're going to, they're going to, move just a little bit with temperature changes and all that kind of stuff and just make sure you you get your valve stems away enough um, from those and, and protect it so they won't cut the valve stem that's the only thing that i've seen it happens to those Alyssa asks best place to get new appliances for rvs where's the best place to get new appliances for rvs and most of the time you're gonna you're gonna have to look at something like a dealership, PPL is one that um, is, is online. Um, you, you can get some appliances through local uh, you know, residential style. We're seeing a lot more manufacturers are using residential style um, microwaves and um, other appliances like that. You know, when you get into something like a, a refrigerator and such, that's pretty much got to be a dealership or an authorized Norcold uh, refrigerator center because you're talking LP and 120 volt power. Um, but you see more manufacturers are going to residential refrigerators as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, t I personally like the absorption refrigerator. I can use it on LP and boondock, not have to worry about battery power, but, uh, you know, those things you're going to have to go directly to a, a dealership for. 
Judy asks, uh, with the wheel and play question, the coach is a 2001 Monaco dynasty. Okay, so the wheel play is a 2001 Monaco dynasty, which is going to be on a, um, a, a chassis. It's a Roadmaster. Roadmaster, I, uh, I think it's a Roadmaster chassis. Monaco made their own chassis, and they had their own division, and they called it a Roadmaster chassis version of it. So it probably has a new way front suspension steering system and you're getting you're you're, you're getting wear and tear um on those um and i don't know if it's it's not ball bearings that just came to mind i just lost my my description uh the uh tie rods and and your your connecting pieces so you're that one um you're going to have to find a dealership that's familiar with that monaco and because it's it's you know, nothing like the Cummins or anything else. It's their proprietary unit. So I would see if you can find a, a, a Fleetwood dealer or a dealer that's familiar with Monaco. You know, Monaco used to be on its own. Fleetwood then bought them out after Navistar had them. So um, that is a proprietary system. Scott asked, uh, would like to install a second air conditioner, Forest River Heritage Glen is pre-wired. Does that include a thermostat wire? Should I be concerned adding the additional height fifth wheel is listed as 12 foot seven? So he's asking that he wants to add a second air conditioner and it's already pre-wired for it. Does that include the thermostat? And usually that does not include the thermostat, but uh, every manufacturer does it a little different. And even within the manufacturer, every division does it different. And even within that, if sometimes every year they do something different. So, um, you know, the thing you need to look for is when you get up there and normally they pre-wire it back to where you had a roof vent in there, probably a powered roof vent. And so you take that roof vent out and then you should see the wires. One set of wires should be the Romex that has the 120 volts. So you got, a, you know, the, the um, L1 ground and a neutral. And then you should, if it has a thermostat, it will have a very small, usually brown or gray, 24 volt wire. And that's a real small wire like you would see, um, not the old, kind of the, the old uh, telephone cords or, you know, it's, but it's a, it's a very small, like an 18 gauge um, wire that's just, all it's going to do is run, and I said 24 volt, 12 volt. Uh, power to it. So you should see that up in there. Now, the height question he asks about, you know, should I, should I be concerned about that? Um, you know, if, if it was already pre-wired for that, then, you know, um, some models would have that on there. You do have to take into account what does that add to the height of your roof. You already have one on it. So wherever that's at, but if it's a toy hauler, a lot of your toy haulers, the back end are a little bit higher. So from the ground up, you might want to measure that. Another option, if you're going to add a second air conditioner, uh, the Penguin and some other ones, uh, Dometic, now have the low profile version of those. So they're much thinner and they don't stick up as much. So that's something that uh, you might want to consider. And there's no more questions. Okay. Well, again, re remember there is a free download in the chat version uh, or chat section of this for keeping mice out of your RV. Um, I will be posting some stuff next week on the Rubberfoot Buffalo, and I'll do it on the uh, uh, RV Repair Club site about our, our venture out into Death Valley and a couple of really interesting um, mysteries that have happened over the years out there and, and some things we'll be looking at. Um, if you have any other questions, make sure you, you post them into our social media. We've got Facebook. We've got a variety of places uh, that you can post it. And I guess with that, we are uh, going to say good night and uh, have fun out there. Hope you get a chance to get out this weekend and, and uh, do some RVing. So stay safe. I get my second COVID shot coming up in a couple weeks. And uh, so take care, everybody. I appreciate you coming out tonight.